So with the upcoming Dominion Cup competition in Richmond, Virginia, I decided to brew a batch of my favorite house IPA recipe, see if I could compete with the big boys in the IPA category. So why do I have two beers in front of me? Well, one of these was dry hop warm at fermentation temperature. The other was cold crash and dry hop cold. Let's see which one I like better. So welcome to Cascades Homebrew. This is Brent. Uh, glad you could stop by. If you like this kind of content, you want to get more in your feed, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, share it with your friends. If you have any suggestions or comments, go ahead and leave them below. Sometimes I know I ramble on a little bit, but I'm trying to get some informative content out there to show what I'm doing. Um, so before, instead of just sitting here uh, rambling about the recipe, let me go ahead and, and jump into a little bit of footage of the brew day and describe what we've done here. And then we'll come back and we'll drink some beers. As I prep for brew day, let me give you a little background. So this is an IPA recipe I've brewed several times. Well, I've brewed versions of this basic recipe several times. It started heavily based on a clone of recipes from Racer 5 IPA. I tweaked the grain bill a little bit over time. One change was to drop the carob pills, which I'm not sure really adds anything to a beer like this. I'm using more hops than most of the Racer 5 clones, but I kind of like the hop level. I also swap up the hops for most batches. And moving forward, I will just continue to use different hop combinations in this recipe. Since this beer is for a competition, I decided to use a hop combo that I liked in the past. I'm using Columbus for bittering and Centennial Chinook for flavor and aroma. So I'm brewing an American IPA style 21A. I'm targeting five and a half gallons or about 21 liters in the fermenter with an overall efficiency of 73%. My original gravity came up just a touch above my target of 1065 at 1067, that's cool. Uh, I split this batch into two fermenters, but they both measured at the same target 1014 final gravity. That meant the ABV at 7% was just a touch over my target of 6.8%. The calculated IBUs from this recipe are 105. That doesn't seem, it seems kind of bitter, but in the past this recipe has come out you know, pretty good. This particular batch seemed kind of bitter, so I don't know, maybe I need to tone that back. Uh, the SRM is six, which is a nice light golden color. So the grain bill for this one is pretty simple. It's 85.2% of an American pale or two row malt. In this case, I'm using RAR. 9.3% of malted wheat, I'm using proximity, and then 5.6% of a caramel or crystal 20, and I'm using Breeze. I really like Breeze's C20. I think it has a really nice, clean sweetness that adds just a touch of color. Now we get in the heart of what makes an IPA, the hops. This batch only has a 30 minute boil, so at the start of the boil, I had 0.9 ounces or 25.5 grams of Columbus to give me 37 IBUs. At the 15 minute boil mark, I'm adding hops all for a lot of flavor, but they add quite a bit of bitterness as well, we'll see. So I had one ounce or 28 grams each of Columbus, which gives 29 IBUs, and Centennial, which gives 18 IBUs. So at flame out, I add even more hops. So one and a half ounce, or 42 and a half grams each of Centennial and Chinook. These are mostly for flavor and aroma, but there is still about 10 IBUs each of them. So all those IBUs are adding up. Now can't forget the dry hops. So this batch gets two ounces each or 57 grams of Centennial and Chinook for a dry hop. So I ended up splitting this batch into two different fermenters and dry hop them with a little different strategy. The one I'll call the warm batch was dry hopped at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius for two days before the cold crash. The batch I'm gonna call the cold batch was dry hopped after I cold crashed for another two days at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or about 4.4 degrees Celsius. Then both batches were cold crashed down at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius for another day before packaging. With 10 minutes left in the boil, I had a Warflock tablet. For yeast, I decided to go with Cellar Science Cali Al, which is a dry yeast, and I think it's the same as US05. I don't usually rehydrate my dry yeast, I usually just sprinkle it on, but since I'm dividing it into two fermenters and I need to measure out a specific amount, it seems like a little bit of an easier path to have a sanitized container. So I had the half of each pack, so six gram in each fermenter. 
There ended up being quite a bit of lag, so hopefully choosing the Solar Science Cali out was a good choice. On the screen is the water profile I'm shooting for. So my real goal here is really just getting the sulfate up to around the 200 BPM level. I decided this time that instead of using Epsom salt, which is magnesium sulfate, I was just going to use gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. That meant my calcium level was a little higher this time. I think that's fine. I think around 100 is good. The magnesium, sodium, and chloride are all just the values in my base tap water. The sulfite to chloride ratio of 3.7 seems a little high as I think about it right now, but I'm pretty happy with this water profile. I'm starting with my base tap water. I add 9.3 grams of gypsum to add calcium and sulfate to the water. And then I use 34 milliliters of 10% phosphoric acid. I'm targeting a mash pH of 5.3, but anything in that general range will work. I use a half of a Captain tablet to remove chlorine and chloramine. This bash will match for 60 minutes. I target 152 Fahrenheit or 66.7 Celsius as my mash temperature. Note that this batch will only get a 30 minute boil. The last time I brewed this batch, I did a 60 minute boil. In just a second, I'll put up a slide that shows a little bit more detail about the fermentation temperature. But basically I pitched it at 64 Fahrenheit, or 18 C. Uh, as fermentation slowed, I raised the temperature up a little bit. And then this one kind of took a little while to get going. And then with the dry hops in there, it was on day 18, I finally got around to put it into a keg. And I split it into a pair of two and a half gallon kegs. Here's a slide that I hope will clarify a little bit of what I'm doing as far as fermentation temperatures and my dry hopping schedule. So I started at 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, there's no metric conversion on this graph. And then I slowly, by day eight, had ramped it up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit and held it there. On day 13, I dry hopped what I call the warm batch. So for two days at 70 degrees, and then I cold crashed the beer. I then added the dry hop into the cold batch on day 15 for two more days, and then cold crashed both batches. So the warm batch had a total of five days of dry hop contact time, where the cold batch had a total of three days of dry hop contact time. The brew day for this batch was pretty uneventful and just followed my standard process. I will include a little footage here of adding the grain to the water. There's something just magical about this moment. I know legally it's when you add yeast that it becomes beer, but I always think that this is the point where it really starts to become beer. Also, it wouldn't be an IPA without hops. Remember, this batch only has a 30 minute boil, so as I come up to boil, I add my 30 minute bittering addition. A bigger hop addition with only 15 minutes left in the boil and then an even bigger flame out addition. With all the hops added loose in the kettle, I won't claim it was simple to get all the wort into the two fermenters while filtering out most of the hop debris, but I think I managed okay. Note to self, a pile of leaf mulch is not the best background for a brewing video. I'm still not exactly sure why I brewed in my garage today, uh, but I'm guessing there was a threat of rain. I let the two fermenters chill the pitching temperatures in my fermentation chamber. I then came back to pitch my yeast. As I mentioned earlier, I had rehydrated the Cellar Science Cali Ale dry yeast, and then I pitched half of it into each fermenter. I saw some minor signs of fermentation after about a day, but it really took a good two days before the fermentation was really starting up. I'm not used to that much of a lag with a Chico yeast. At around the 20 hour mark, there were only minor signs of fermentation. And even at the 48 hour mark, fermentation was a bit slow. Yeah, maybe not a big deal, but I do like to see active fermentation start up a bit faster. Maybe I should have gone with one and a half packs or maybe my rehydration process hurt me more than it helped. Oh well, in any case, I wanted to show a little of my current process for dry hopping and avoiding cold side oxidation. So it was about 48 hours ago, I pitched yeast into the IPA and we're gonna cold crash this beer. So I wanna avoid suck back. When, you, when the beer chills, uh, both the beer and the air is gonna condense, potentially could suck back either um, solution, either from a blow off tube or solution from an airlock and also suck air into it. And air for hoppy beers is, is uh, detrimental to flavor and color. 
Uh, so the solution I came up with, and I didn't really come up with myself, I copied it from some stuff I saw on, on Homebrew Talk, um, is uh, using a balloon system. So I've got a couple balloons. Um, I'll do a quick little look a little closer at how these are made. I'm going to probably replace these soon because I have some ideas on, on changing some of the tubing. But still the same concept. Essentially I've got a, a T here, just a, a barb T that I, I got at, at Home Depot. Um, I'm going to put a small uh, piece of tubing there, which will go into another small piece of, or that was cut off a racking cane. So that will go into the top of the fermenter, into the airlock, you know, where, where an airlock would go. Um, this particular uh, this particular stopper seems a little tight. The other ones are a little easier. So now we're going to have a solution like that comes up with its stopper. We're going to take our balloon on one side like that, and then we're going to have a blow off tube on the other side. So like that, that blow off tube then is going to run it. So I've got just some, some plastic bottles that, that were some malt liquor. I cut a hole in the top. So these are just convenient and they fit in there. Well, I'll put a little star sand in there. And so how this will work is I'll give it a, you know, several hours once it gets going, filling with air or the CO2 starts, you know, is punched, pushed out all the air from the tube and, and out of the head space. Um, then I'll go ahead and un, you know, undo this. I just have some, uh, a wrapper, a twist tie around the balloon. Um, and then that will just, just that minimal pressure will, will force the balloon to inflate. Uh, with CO2. Um, and then when I cold crash, instead of pulling any air or you know, solution uh, from, from the, the bottle, it'll pull back CO2 from the balloon. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and rig those up. I figured it'd be easy, a lot easier to see it out here than it would be in the chamber. Um, so I'll go ahead and connect those and then we'll I'll cycle back all right, so I have one of them attached. I'm not quite sure how much we'll be able to see on the camera here. But you see, I had just had those with foil over the top. I'm gonna take, I've got the two little jars down there. I'm gonna stick one end down in the solution. Um, this one, I'm just gonna go right in there. It, And then if we zoom in, you can kind of see, see our fermentation is starting off slow, but there's bubbles. I, I suspect um, 10 or 15 minutes, we'll start seeing some bubbles down in, in the water bottles. I suck the, so the water bottles, they fit down in there. I couldn't find one of the caps, so I don't have that. So again, here's, again, uh, just the cap or the a, a piece of tubing down in there into a balloon, into a blow off. And then when I, um, when I keg, we'll see, I'll use, I'll connect this directly uh, to the keg gas post to a uh, quick disconnect. And then we'll use that as the gas return into the fermenter while I'm filling the kegs. So today is Tuesday. So day four of fermentation. This batch really did uh, kind of got started slower than I uh, typically expect from either you know dried yeast, the US05, or you know some of the liquid dried yeast. And I've used this um, cellar science yeast before, but right now everything is going well. I ended up uh, I realized my old uh, one of the the balloons had had a leak, so it wasn't filling up. So I swapped it out for a new one. Uh, you can definitely see where the convenience these smaller ones um, fits in here. This one fits in pretty big, pretty tight in there. It takes up a lot of room. Uh, but if we look down in there, I don't know if we can see, we probably can't really see. Uh, the tube goes, um, the other tube goes down into a blow off, just a bottle. Um, I can hear the bubbling down in the, uh, in the bubbles. So these, and these are both 
just enough the pressure of I guess pushing through the water and, and the is enough that it keeps these these actually reasonably firmly inflated. Um, Croizen on the beer is is pretty strong. I expect probably another good day of strong fermentation and then it will probably start to settle down. The temperature is still sitting at uh, 64 degrees. As fermentation starts to slow, I'll go ahead and boost that up a couple degrees each day to try to drive full fermentation. Uh, hopefully these will be, um, the, given the delay and the, the start, whether we'll be able to get them in the keg in you know, 14 days or if it's a little bit longer. Uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll wait till fermentation is complete before we move on to the dry hopping stage. So it is Friday evening. It's day 13 since the for brew day. Uh, normally I would dry hop a little bit earlier since these beers got off to a, uh, kind of a slow start. I give them a little bit more time, but I think we're good. So what plan is I've labeled them. We've got the warm and cold. The plan is to dry hop the warm one today, give it two days, and we're going to cold crash both of them and then add hops to the, the cold one. So I've got one ounce, is, uh, one ounce of Centennial and one ounce of Chinook. Uh, basic plan, uh, I think eventually I may move to, there's some talk about you know, people like having magnets holding a bag. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but basically what the plan is, and if it goes well, so I've got this funnel, um, is essentially to pull off the stopper, quickly drop the hops through with through the funnel. Um, I do have a CO2 tank handy um, nearby in case something, if it goes slow, but I've kind of found it's a little awkward um, to use that. But just in case, I don't, I don't think much oxygen get in, but we'll see. So I'm gonna go ahead and give it a try. I've got my hops right here handy. Let's go, we're gonna pull this off. Sometimes I get a little, a little persuasion. Use just a slightly larger not sure if we're funnel. bit of CO2 in there for good measure. All right, so I, hopefully that, hopefully we didn't get much oxygen in there. I usually find um, after you add hops, that it'll force a little CO2 out. Um, so we'll mostly just let that sit. I gave it a little shake just to kind of move the hops around the surface. They'll mostly sit and start to drop down. So we'll check back on these in uh, very two days and to cold crash and then to uh, dry hop the cold one. So hey, it is Sunday evening. I was just about ready to head to bed and I thought, oh, I gotta dry hop my beer. So I've got my ounce of Chinook and an ounce of Centennial. Uh, we're gonna dry hop the cold one. So the temperature on the beer is right around uh, 40. I settled it at 45. I'm gonna drop it down to 40, keep it going. but. We're going to go ahead and add our hops to the uh, second batch. So I've got two right here. Go ahead and
So it is Tuesday evening. I was hoping maybe to get the beers in the keg tonight, but I, they've been sitting right now. Um, so this one was, was dry hopped two days ago. So they've been two days at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I still see a bit of hop matter on the, the surface. Um, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, drop the cold crash temperature down right to freezing, see if we can clear them up, at least let them sit overnight, potentially keg them uh, tomorrow morning or sometime you know tomorrow afternoon um, and hopefully we'll be uh, have some nice clear beer going into the uh, fermenter So this is day 17 of fermentation. So I decided to cold crash the beers down to near freezing uh, for a good about 24 hours, um, a little less than that, but 20-ish hours. Um, still a little bit of uh, residual stuff on the, the top of both of them. But they look pretty good. So there should be good to, good to uh, go ahead and keg. So that's my next step. We can see a little bit difference in um, you know, how the yeast, this is the the one where that the hops are added in cold, which means some of the a lot of the yeast had uh, settled out before the hops were added. So you get a big thick layer of hops on the top. So sometimes with this one is not quite um, quite as thick of a layer of hops on top, and the hops are kind of uh, mixed in a little bit more with the, the yeast. It's not a drastic difference, though. One of the issues I have with uh, you know if I want to cold crash down near freezing is my. Uh, my blow-off tube uh, bottle tends to uh, freeze. It's sitting on the bottom. So hopefully I can get the uh, let those soften up a little bit and get the tube out of there because I use that tube as part of my uh, closed uh, transfer into the keg. But so right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to purge the kegs uh, and then come back when we're ready to start filling a keg. I right, ended up having to uh, put that in some warm water to get some of the ice out of the end of the tube and then I purged out. So this should be, so this line here should be full of CO2. All right, hopefully, this is going to go on the in line. So now we're going to some pressure from the kegs and uh, oops that's the outline hopefully that'll push any air in here out we got the fill inline filter hope to trap any little residual and test our closed transfer setup all right if we got some gunk on the first Pour there. All right, we'll let that go. That's going to take a few minutes. All right, showing the closed transfer system here. So I've got a tube on the out spigot from my fermenter. It's running down through an inline filter, which uh, hopefully should catch any little hop debris before it, gets, so it keeps it from getting in the keg. That's going into the uh, what is the outpost. Of the keg, so the dip tube down to the bottom. There's a line that's connected that was purged with CO2 uh, from the uh, the gas post, which then runs. And this is just the tube that was my blow-off tube during fermentation. Uh, that's returning air to the top. It's running. It's, it'll. Uh, it'll. It's running. It seems like a little slow. I think. Uh, we got, got a little bit of uh, hop debris in the filter that may be uh, slowing things down a little bit, but it'll, I'll just let it run for uh, 10 minutes or so and, and it'll be all kegged and ready for the next batch. 
So this beer has been in the keg for less than two weeks. I think it'll be right around the two week mark when I need to bottle it up and submit some for the competition. Um, so I wanted to sit down and evaluate these two beers just to make sure which one I wanted to submit. Um, you know, full disclosure, I, uh, I filmed this, this tasting earlier. I had them blind marked on the bottom and I forgot to turn on my, my camera. So that's part of my, part of upgrading my channel. I got a new cam, new microphone for my camera, but I do have to turn the power on to make it work. Um, so instead of going through the, the same, trying to figure them out blind and pretend like I don't know that, um, and then maybe I'd get them wrong. I got them right the first time. I just I just went ahead and labeled them. So this one is the one that was warm dry hop. So I dry hopped it at fermentation temperature. Um, cold crashed them both. Added the dry hops to this one. I'm just gonna go ahead. I'm gonna my my feedback on the beers is is they're both they're both very close. When I first started tasting them, day one day two, I was really worried. There was a lot of astringency. And it really seemed like there was a lot of difference between the two, that the cold dry hop one seemed more bitter, more astringent. The warm dry hop one felt like it just had a little bit more flavor that maybe covered up a little bit of the bitterness. And I think that's still what they are. If we, it's got a lot of that, that nice kind of classic, um, it's like Chinook and Centennial are the hops in this one. Got the aroma, got a lot of sort of mouth coating hop flavor you know, and bitterness. We'll come back to the bitterness in a minute, but. So I feel like the dry hop one, it's a nice clean beer. It has a little less hop flavor that I enjoy, um, which I think then makes the, the bitterness kind of shine through more. I think the astringency that I had evaluated the first few days has settled. Um, they've definitely improved over the the week they've been in the keg, and I think you know probably be and they probably won't be prime uh, when I put them in the bottle. But hopefully, you know, sitting in the bottle by the time the competition comes about, they'll still be still be fresh. Uh, you know, my over feedback on the recipe itself. Uh, the, the hop characters, so the, the Centennial and Chinook that were used in this, they were a, a new bag from a new vendor. They don't, they don't seem quite as, as appealing and just flavorful as I remember the last batch, but it, it, it could be just memory. It could just be that, I mean, the, there's definitely more bitterness here than, than I remember or I enjoy. When you say duh, because the recipe, you know, calculates out 105 IBUs. Um, but I think, I think, um, I strongly suspect I get less IBUs on my system than what's calculated. And in general, sometimes once you get up that 80, 90 IBUs, they don't, they don't really matter anyways. Um, but it's a wonderful looking beer. I think it's just, it's a color that I like a lot. Both of these beers, they look identical. Um, if there's any difference, it's really in the glass. Yeah, and maybe the lighting. It's a nice light colored beer. You know, that crystal 20 in there. Uh, the wheat, I, I think that I like the, the sweetness from the crystal. A little bit of, a, a little more flavor. I still think wheat, I think wheat in a beer adds some of that creamy, creaminess, the mouth feel, head retention. If you can see how these are really you know, cling into the glass. You know, the beer is nice and light and refreshing and drinkable, um, but it's also got some flavor. It's not just a Pilsner with a bunch of hops in it. So it's exactly what I, I like as far as the grain bill. This, the only, they say the only negatives I would say of this batch, I feel like maybe the hop character isn't quite as, you know, bright and, and expressive as I would like. You know, I wonder, the bitterness seems a little harsher than what I, remember so it'd be interesting to see if the bitterness settles down a little bit uh, it'll be also be interesting to see from a, a competition point of view it could be that a little bit of bitterness will help it stand out you know, if it depends on where it shows up in the judges order the judges palace may start to be a little bit fatigued so maybe a, a little extra bitterness a little bit of that extra kind of hoppy character will will jump out 
it'd be interesting to see where the classic hop aromas or classic hops you know compete against the the new sexy citrusy mosaic -y, you know the citra mosaic simcoe even you know which is citra um, those type of hops or like new zealand hops so this is this is all classic columbus centennial chinook but I think it's a well executed IPA that I, I think has it has the potential to do well. I don't think it's the best batch of this particular recipe that I've ever executed. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how the bottle holds up, um, if the carbonation holds up, if the you know, avoid oxidation in the bottle, if the hoppy aromas and see if maybe some of the bitterness has uh, mellowed out um, so that I need to bottle these up probably Thursday Friday I'm driving down to Richmond to take them with me it's about a week before the competition uh, drop-off deadline and then I think it's about three weeks after that before the uh, the actual competition judging is so there's about to be about four week between when I bottle them and drop them off in the competition but I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up this video here. Um, again, if you, if you like the content, go ahead and subscribe. Um, if you have some feedback for me, please go ahead and leave it in the comments or, or co get in touch with me. Uh, again, this is Brent, CascadesHomebrew.com. Um, let's get together, learn about beer, and, and let's build some great beer.